Thank you very much, and it's a tremendous honor and pleasure to be here. I really appreciate the invitation and uh, look forward to your questions. And I know you're going to see a lot of slides, and I know I'm also the last speaker keeping uh, lunch away from all of you, so I want to be sure that we stay on time, but I'll be glad to share the slides with you after the fact if anybody uh, needs a copy. Well, we're talking about global food and health trends. This is quite a change, but I think at the end of the presentation, for those of you who are in the marketing, particularly that they're relevant for these particular issues, you'll see some of the challenges and some of the opportunities that are ahead. And I think in terms of truth and packaging, as you said, Keeling, I am a, a former journalist, an ex-journalist, or was also called a recovering journalist, and this may say a lot about uh, the way that I cover some of these issues. This is your consumer, and this is where the consumer today is, coming in to make a food choice. You have risk and you have benefits. And it doesn't matter if it's retail, it doesn't matter if uh, it's in the restaurant arena, it's still the sort of the same picture for the consumer. We used to always say when we were in the media, we might cover trends with the opinion leaders, but when we began to see it show up in the comic strips or in the political cartoons in the paper, we knew an issue was resonating with the public. Well, what drives consumer behavior? Time, taste, health confusion have been there for a while, increasingly cost, as we've heard in the last year, starting with, with Dan's presentation, very relevant. Increase in eating at home, very much there as well. And as I say, many of the same trends, however, impact the eating at home as, as away from home uh, eating occasions. When we looked at food in the past, it was very personal. It was something we made a decision on, we made a decision for our families. What we have much more today is food as a political statement. It's risk, it's fuel, it's ethics, and it's medicine. It's basically bringing back to the old Hippocrates uh, quote about uh, food as medicine. In terms of what's unique today is these trends are all converging so that they're really not different, they're blurring together. And this is where I think some of the unique challenges as well as some of the unique opportunities are occurring. And I'm not going to spend time on food as fuel, but we're all hearing about climate change and global warming and the need for alternative energy sources. Well, this is putting a huge amount of pressure on the agricultural industries. It's an opportunity uh, as well as on world trade. There's significant issues from a cost perspective on food as well. And clearly, it's in the political cartoons. I uh, hear uh, this is going to be somewhat US centric, particularly in terms of the cartoons. But I want to emphasize these are global <laughs> trends that we are getting, whether you're speaking at a conference in Asia, else anywhere in Europe, basically, at this point. Everywhere except for sub Saharan Africa, some of these same issues are coming forth. So you have big oil, you have big drug, and you have big agriculture here competing for uh, the policymakers and the attention of the leaders. You also have food as ethics and values. And this is something, at least from the US perspective, is very, very different. We used to just basically see food as food, but now it's sustainable, it's organic, it's got a story behind it, it's locally grown, it's, it's, it's animal welfare. It's where basically the food and agriculture industries have gotten into some trouble, particularly if in, you're in meat and dairy production, because they're linking this as a unique cause, not only of ill health with people, but also ill health for the environment. So just one example. But again, this is, this is worn like a political button right now, saying this is what I stand for. This is what used to be in the US considered the European way of thinking, where you're much more closely tied to where your food comes from. And it's again, a very different sort of mindset. This is true now in the US as well, as we saw in our most recent political campaign, which by the way is just a year since uh, uh, President Obama was elected, and we'll hear a little bit more about that as we move along, because he's taken up these causes and his wife Michelle a, in a major way. And then this is just one of the cartoons, I hope you can see it. Always uh, the New Yorker is ahead of the game, and this is, uh, we think it's terribly important that you meet the people responsible for the food you're eating tonight, and that includes the cows. So just to be sure, we have all, all represented. 
It's also seen as risk, and this is probably the most significant challenge out there right now. And without looking at all of the elements on this slide, the first two, food safety, whether it's real or perceived, is leading the headlines in a major way, again, on a global scale. And certainly all nutrition issues today are seen through the eyes of obesity. And we'll hear more about that. And clearly, this is our typical American child, although increasingly children around the world. The fastest growing rate right now of obesity in the world is Italian boys from six to nine. So this is the child hooked up to fat, salt, and sugar on the couch watching TV. And then this is one, again, from a U.S. perspective, very different. It's something that might have been understood during the days of BSE and some of the other crises in Europe. But before, FDA and Food and Drug Administration and our U.S. agencies were extremely well thought of, had high respect um, from the American public. This is for the old Popeye cartoon, I'm here to punch you for not protecting the food supply. He opens his can of spinach, he downs it and falls over dead, and the FDA says, there's method to my madness. This would not have appeared a couple of years ago in the U.S. A fundamental shift, again, much more in keeping with what we're seeing elsewhere from China to Europe to the U.S., uh, again, to Southeast Asia. It's also seen as medicine, however, where essentially you can get the functional benefits, whether it be the traditional antioxidants, vitamins, minerals from whole foods, all the way through to the enhanced foods, the so-called functional foods, and there's some technology coming down the line to really increase that. However, there is consumer skepticism coming on this as well. I think you can see from these two slides, this is flax is this year's tofu. And then uh, gullibos, uh, where uh, this particular cereal is good for anything and everything that ails you. And as I was on my way across the Atlantic to come to the conference, one of our major multinational cereal companies got into a lot of trouble because they're putting immunity claims on the front of a cereal, uh, cereal box, supposedly in order to make sure that they have extra appeal to cope with the H1N1 epidemic. But in reality, uh, th that's, that's not necessarily the way they have framed it. But there have been a number of media stories. So skepticism is there. And you want a skeptical, a healthy, skeptical consumer. You don't necessarily want a cynical consumer. And that would be true whether you're talking food or or other issues as well. Again, I mentioned the convergence. If you've not heard of Michael Pollan, The Omnivore's D uh, Dilemma, he's one of the more celebrity authors who is reframing the public dialogue in the US, and he is beginning to hit the global circuit as well. He talks about it. it's about food, health, the environment, and the economy. And the International Obesity Task Force, which is headquartered in the UK, said we must merge the obesity agenda with the environmental <laughs> agenda. And that means there's a change in the way the whole agri-food chain is seen, so that you have ag, you have food and nutrition, you have food safety, the environment, bringing in everybody from the grower on one end all the way to the consumer on the other. That's where you get charges, essentially, of the industrialized food and ag system and how that has many negatives. What we've also seen around the world, and whether you capitalize the P and the P on this or not, the precautionary principle is now the underlying premise for decision making when it comes to the nutrition, food, health, safety, overall decisions. Public health is the driver, not basic science to the extent that it once was, but basically if it's good for public health, we'll try it. And then that brings into consideration this idea we can't wait anymore for evidence-based pr practice to prove itself out. What we have to do is we have to try things, practice-based evidence, in order to gain some control and see what works and see what doesn't. We also have new words. Globesity got coined about eight years ago when this became the whole obesity epidemic became so, so global in perspective. But now we have globalization and eco-nutrition, which also are surfacing. 
And one of our top activist organizations in, in the states is Center for Science and the Public Interest. They always are just ahead of where the industry is on some of these curves. And they said back in 2007, when they talked about their top 10 foods, by the way, which change every six months or so, but this was the list uh, in, in the summer of 07. They said the criteria used to select the foods were health, convenience, and environmental concerns. What's interesting with all this sort of attention to the food and health phenomenon is all, the health recommendations themselves are all converging as well. And basically they can be called lifestyle recommendations because the risk of chronic disease in today's world is from overnutrition as opposed to undernutrition, as I say, with the exception of sub-Saharan Africa. So you would say the same thing to prevent cardiovascular disease, is now you would say for osteoporosis or diabetes or cancer. So again, very much lifestyle guidance in terms of eating less and moving more as such. And science and research drives media and policy. Uh, and even though we have a tremendous interest in the social media, and the social media is real, and it, is, it does have a phenomenal impact, and I agree that it is here to stay in every way, these issues are debated in the social media as much as they are in the more conventional or the so-called old media. 